my screen? Nope. Uh, what do I have to do? Oh, I have to go down to share screen. And do you see it now? Well, hang on just a second. Yep. You're there. You're there. Um, okay. Well, give me just a minute here. Well, some people say they see it. I see it, Curtis. Well, I can't read the screen here. Um, okay. Yes. I see it fine. I see it. And <clears throat> I think I think we're set to go. Okay, fabulous. Uh, I want to thank Steve for inviting me to do this. Uh, it, 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 it's been a long road. It's been uh, uh, last weekend was the first time I've been to the observatory in three and a half years. In uh, July 2019, well before the pandemic, I broke my leg and that ended my tour season in 2019. And then, of course, we've been shut down for uh, uh, almost three years. So it, it's good to be back. Uh, I must give credit where credit is due to this presentation. The core of this talk, the slides, were originally prepared by Scott Cardell. Now, I have had my fingers all over this and changed things and moved things, uh, but I do need to give uh, Scott credit for this. However, everything that is in this presentation is my responsibility. Uh, before we had a space program, before we had the uh, uh, James Webb Space Telescope and uh, uh, trips to the moon and all that kind of thing, big science was represented by Palomar Observatory. <clears throat> Back in the uh, 1930s and 1940s, this was the big science project that captured everyone's attention. And everybody who was even slightly interested in astronomy or had some part of the project made sure that, that people got to see their participation in Palomar Observatory. Uh, first slide here shows a, uh, this is the cover of the Sky Magazine from December, 1936. Those of you who have been in astronomy for some time probably know that modern Sky and Telescope magazine was formed from the merger of the Sky and the Telescope, separate magazines, in uh, late 1941. So here's a picture of a plexiglass model of the 200-inch uh, Hale Telescope. And we will see a picture of this model later on in the talk. Uh, here's a uh, Collier's magazine. Uh, I don't think Collier's is published anymore, but it used to be a very popular uh, magazine. And here's their uh, opinion of what the observatory looks like. You'll notice up in the upper right corner, it talks about Palomar's giant eye. And over the years, it was a theme in talking about Palomar Observatory that people would talk about it as a giant eye. Uh, the idea that a telescope might use a mirror rather than a lens seemed strange to many people. And they couldn't quite get their uh, brains around the idea that the telescope did not have a mirror or did not have a lens. So they would always talk about the giant eye. And we will see that over and over again. And I think there's still some of that misconception about it. So here's a uh, <clears throat> sort of a, a comic book style magazine that uh, uh, promoted the uh, message of Palomar. Here's a US postage stamp from 1948. Here's the city seal of the city of Escondido. Excuse me. <clears throat> and you can see that the dome of the observatory is on the uh, seal of the city of Escondido. I wonder what was in that spot on their seal before uh, the observatory came into being. Here's Palomar oranges. Whoops. 
Palmer Mountain spring water. Now, those of you who come up to the observatory frequently have probably encountered the water trucks. And believe it or not, Palomar Mountain spring water actually comes from Palomar Mountain. They have a spigot partway on the road to the observatory where they get their water. Uh, I don't know if you can buy Palomar spring water right now or not in, in the stores. I've personally never seen it. Uh, Mobile Oil Company proves the oil that the telescope floats on while it's operating. And so they made sure that everybody knew that. Uh, I see that there's a, a tiny air there. It talks about Mount Palomar. There is no such place as Mount Palomar. It is Palomar Mountain. And you'll also notice that they call it the biggest eye. Here's another, the eye that sees. Corning Glassworks, who made our mirror. That is the back side of the mirror, which is um, was more interesting to look at than the front side. Kaiser Aluminum, they made the aluminum that we use to coat the mirror to make it reflected. We even had our own road signs. Now, about five years ago, they uh, uh, put up some new signs because over the years, these old signs had uh, uh, had disappeared. Uh, I don't know the current status of these signs, but count yourself lucky if you see one when you're heading up to the observatory. So today's discussion is gonna be about the history of the observatory, how it came to be, and uh, we will ask some historic pictures. <laughs> Palomar Observatory, is owned and operated by the California Institute of Technology. That's Caltech. It's all privately owned. It is not part of NASA. It is not part of the University of California. For 45 years, our big telescope, the 200 inch Hale telescope was the largest effective telescope in the world. Now, those of you who are astronomy enthusiasts know that the uh, another nation built a slightly bigger telescope in the 1970s. And I'm not aware of much in the way of serious research that has come out of that telescope. Whereas by contrast, if you look in astronomy books or magazines for any time since 1948, you will see pictures that have been taken with the 200 inch Hale telescope. The observatory originated with a grant of $6 million obtained in 1928 by George Ellery Hale from the International Education Board of the Rockefeller Foundation. Hale died in 1938, and when the telescope was dedicated in 1948, they named it in his honor. George Ellery Hale never saw the telescope. He last visited Palomar in 1934, and the construction of the telescope hadn't, hadn't started then. Even the mirror was not finished then. So Hale never saw the telescope that bears his name. <clears throat> We owe the presence of the observatory to George Ellery Hale. Uh, George Ellery Hale came from Chicago. He came from a rather wealthy family. His father built elevators, Hale Elevator Company, and he helped to rebuild Chicago after the Great Fire of 1871. Uh, it's useful to point out that the skyscraper, the steel skyscraper was invented in Chicago, not in New York. And Hale's father was part of building uh, those skyscrapers after the Great Fire. But Hale didn't want to build, George did not want to build elevators. He wanted to study science. And he built a personal science lab on the upper floor of his home in Chicago. And he built his own observatory. Hale went to MIT to study physics. And while he was there, he invented an instrument called the spectral heliograph for studying the sun. Because of his background, because his father was quite wealthy and uh, George was uh, accustomed to being around wealthy people, he had, a, uh, uh, he had the ability to talk to wealthy people and persuade them to pay for big telescopes. So here, for example, we have a picture of George 
arm in arm with Andrew Carnegie. Now he got Andrew Carnegie to pay for telescopes and a very nice observatory up on Mount Wilson. And I know we have some people who are uh, from the Mount Wilson community in on the Zoom talk today. Now, when I look at this picture, I can almost hear the conversation between Hale and Carnegie. And Hale is saying to Carnegie, uh, Mr. Carnegie, I would like some money for a bigger telescope. And Carnegie says to him, son, you can have anything you need. So these were Hale's first three big telescopes. The 40 inch refractor at Yerkes Observatory, the uh, 60 inch reflector at Mount Wilson and the 100 inch reflector at Mount Wilson. Each in their time was the largest telescope in the world. Now, when we look at the 40 inch refractor at Yerkes Observatory, that went into operation in 1897. The telescope is located in Wisconsin, north of Chicago. And those of you who know about astronomy may think, <clears throat> well, Wisconsin doesn't sound like a very good place for a big telescope, and it isn't. But the telescope is there because Charles Tyson Yerkes, who gave the money for the telescope, wanted it to be near Chicago. Now, this telescope, when you look at it, it looks like what most people think a big telescope should look like. There's a big lens in front, and you look at it from the back. And when this was built in 1897, that's exactly the kind of astronomy this was intended for. An astronomer would look through a telescope, he would make drawings and take notes of whatever he saw. But even in 1897, astronomers were becoming interested in taking pictures. A picture is permanent. You can study it years later. You can put filters on the telescope and control what kind of light your film or glass plates in this case uh, were taking. You can take, uh, you can record spectrographs, uh, I mean, spectrograms, the images of the uh, light split up from a star or galaxy to see what it's made of and how it's moving. So astronomers were starting to take pictures. Now the telescope at the lower left, the 60 inch reflector uses a big mirror instead of a lens to collect light. And that telescope was to my knowledge, the first large telescope in the world that was designed specifically to take pictures and not to look through. So that telescope, when it went, when it went into operation in 1908, was the world's largest telescope. Uh, Harlow Shapley used that telescope to uh, prove that the uh, Milky Way that the uh, Milky Way, that the universe was not centered on the Earth or the solar system, that we were somewhere on the out, outer reaches of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, at that time, Milky Way galaxy was thought to constitute the entire universe. So this is a historic telescope in its own right. Now, astronomers are always wanting more light. Hale was always asking for more light, more light. And to get more light, you need a bigger mirror. So the telescope on the right went into operation in 1917. For 30 years, the 100 inch Hooker reflector was the world's largest telescope. It is named after John Hooker, who was a hardware merchant in Los Angeles. And he gave the money for the mirror for the telescope and maybe some other things at the observatory too. Edwin Hubble used this telescope to prove that not only was the solar system not at the center of the universe, or not at the center of the galaxy, but that our galaxy, Milky Way, was not even the only galaxy in the universe. He proved that those funny little spiral nebulae that had puzzled astronomers in their photographs were actually galaxies way outside of our own. And a popular term at the time was island universes. Now, when these telescopes, the 60 inch and the 100 inch reflector were installed on Mount Wilson, 
Mount Wilson was a very dark place. And Mount Wilson to this day is famous for a steady air, which makes for sharp pictures. But uh, Los Angeles grew up below the mountain and Mount Wilson is not as dark today as it once was. Now there's an irony here. These two telescopes, the 60 inch and the 100 inch were built specifically to take pictures and not to look through. Well, today you can look through these telescopes and I encourage anybody who's interested to contact the people at Mount Wilson and find out how they can actually look through one of these telescopes. Hale had bigger ideas. Uh, well, bef uh, almost immediately after the 100-inch Hooker reflector was put into operation, people started talking about bigger telescopes. This was a drawing by uh, Francis Pease of Mount Wilson Observatory that he did in 1919 for a proposed 300-inch telescope. The things really started to take shape in 1928. Hale published an article in Harper's Magazine about the possibilities of large telescopes. And in the article, he made the memorable quote, starlight is falling on every square mile of the Earth's surface. And the best we can do at present is to gather up and concentrate the rays that strike an area 100 inches in diameter. And of course, he was referring to the 100 inch Hooker telescope on Mount Wilson. Things quickly moved after that. Over a period of several months, including the exchange of lots of letters and memorandums and, and, uh, uh, and ideas, Hale reached an agreement with the International Education Board of the Rockefeller Foundation to provide a grant of $6 million for a complete observatory and a giant telescope. And you can see at the top of this uh, copy. Now, I wonder how they did this copy because they didn't have Xerox machines back then. And this is not a carbon. But uh, uh, any, anyhow, so this is a copy of the agreement. You can see George Ellery Hale's signature at the top, approved by George E. Hale. And you can see the number $6 million up there in the upper left. Another inspiration for the observatory was Russell Williams Porter. And whoops, sorry. Russell Porter <clears throat> was a telescope builder, <clears throat> an artist, an engineer, an Arctic explorer. He was many things. <clears throat> and he participated in the design of the observatory, the dome, and the telescope. Uh, when you look at the a uh, big dome, you may see some resemblance to some of the things that you see at Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Russell Porter also had a, uh, some participation in the design of Griffith Observatory. To us, Russell Porter is most famous for his drawings that he made of the telescope and the observatory. And he made many detailed drawings showing in excruciating detail the aspects of the telescope. And so here's a diagram of the optical pattern of the telescope. Now I mentioned, most of you know this, but there may be some people in on the Zoom call who aren't aware that large observatory telescopes these days use mirrors to collect light, not lenses. So here you can see at the bottom of the picture, you can see the mirror, it's marked A in the picture in uh, Russell Porter's diagram. And so the light hits that mirror, it's brought to a, it, it, the light is reflected to a smaller mirror at the top, marked B. And we can put a camera up there, up, well, we can put a camera up above that mirror, take out mirror B and put a camera up there and take pictures, or we can use mirror B and reflect the light back down through a hole in the big mirror to a camera down on the bottom of the telescope. These days, most of the work done with this telescope is down at the bottom end at what we call the Cassegrain focus. But even still, sometimes pictures are taken up at what we call prime focus, which is marked F in this picture. 
And if you look in old astronomy books and see pictures of galaxies that were taken with a 200 inch Hale telescope, most of those were taken up there at the focus marked F. There's also another focus down at the uh, south end of the telescope, which is not used very often. So here's another one of Russell Porter's diagrams showing, this one shows the prime focus area of the telescope. And this is just an example of the uh, uh, extreme detail that he put in his drawings. Here's another drawing of the uh, proposed appearance of the dome. The uh, Art Deco design of the dome is due to Russell Porter. Now, here's another inspiration a lot of people uh, uh, aren't aware of. We know that John Anderson, who was um, actually managing the project at Caltech, and Russell Porter visited Henry Page Bailey in Riverside at least once. And when you look at the uh, uh, Bailey built, I, I, I think this is only one of the telescopes that he built. He built several. But you can see when you look at the mounting, you can see that it very much resembles the mounting of the 200 inch Hale telescope. And I don't think that's a coincidence. We know that John Anderson and Russell Porter visited uh, Bailey and uh, examined his telescope in some detail. So we had to have a mirror for the telescope. And when they started, originally they wanted to make a mirror out of quartz, fused quartz because they had to make it out of something that would not change shape when the temperature changed. So the first idea was to make a mirror out of fused quartz. And they went to General Electric Corporation and asked them to make a mirror out of fused quartz. Well, the, the short explanation is that GE couldn't do it. They could make some small mirrors, but they couldn't even approach the size of the mirror that was needed. And at this point, Caltech had already spent a tenth of that $6 million budget trying to make a quartz mirror. And they decided uh, to, as they always say, when they fire the football coach, they would take the program in another direction. So they went to Corning Glassworks and Corning had a glass called Pyrex, which does not like to change temperature or change shape with changing temperature. Now Pyrex is not as good as fused quartz, but it's better than uh, ordinary plate glass. And uh, some of you may have Pyrex in your kitchen, uh, baking dishes or uh, baby bottles, uh, things of this sort. Now, ironically, uh, Corning does not make Pyrex anymore. Uh, uh, my understanding is that you can buy things made with original Pyrex in Europe, but not in the United States anymore. In fact, they tore down the factory where they uh, made Pyrex glass. But, but in this picture starting, we can see the mold that the mirror was made in, and we can see the resulting mirror blank after it was polished on the right. Okay, so here's a diagram of the back of the mirror. Now those round holes, there's 36 of them. And in the completed mirror, each of those has a small uh, uh, support in it, which has uh, uses levers and pads and counterweights to help the mirror keep its shape. So here they are building the oven for casting the mirror at Corning Glassworks. The first pouring for the mirror, the first attempt, was March 25th, 1934. And, uh, you know, this picture is kind of amazing because when you look at it, you realize that this could not happen today. The uh, workmen there have a ladle, a giant ladle of molten glass that they are uh, moving around. There's a track above. And so you have people here standing, what, maybe uh, 15 or 20 feet away, watching these workers with this molten glass. I don't think they would allow that today. Now, the casting of this mirror was broadcast on live radio by the famous news broadcaster, Lowell Thomas. So here they're, uh, uh, they're pouring the glass. And here was the final result. Uh, things didn't go very well. Those uh, cavities in the back of the mirror 
that we showed in the previous photo were made by, uh, by brick cores that were held down by steel bolts. And the steel melted due to the hot glass. And the bricks started floating to the top of the glass. And they, this is while the glass was still molten. They thought maybe they could fish the, the uh, bricks out with hooks. But at the end of the day, they realized that this mirror was ruined. <clears throat> so this was the first attempt at the mirror. And so they had a 20 ton piece of glass. And what do you do with a 20 ton piece of glass? You put it on display so people can see it. So here's the first attempt at the mirror. It's on display right now at the uh, Innovation Center at the Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York. So they tried again. They figured out a way to keep those bolts from melting. And they tried again, December 2nd, 1934. And so here we're pouring the glass for the mirror again. This time it worked. Now this, uh, uh, wasn't perfect, but it, it was good enough. It took 10 months to cool down the mirror. It was 10 months. Uh, well, actually, be, uh, before the 10 months were up, George McCauley, who was in charge of the project at Corning, actually went into the oven and crawled around on the surface of the mirror to look at it. And he found some uh, uh, divots in the surface of the mirror that were caused by the uh, <clears throat> sagging of the roof of the uh, cover piece over the oven. But he knew that they wouldn't get to. Uh, uh, cast another mirror. So this was the mirror that they used. <clears throat> Here's the back side of the mirror. George McCauley was in charge of the project at Corning. Uh, he is the man with his hand up against the uh, <clears throat> uh, up against the mirror. So there came a big day in 1936 when it came time to uh, bring the mirror to California. And here the mirror is uh, located on the uh, on a trailer to be moved from Corning Glassworks. Here it's being located, loaded onto a special railway car. Uh, there's a, uh, a hole in the center of the car, uh, this flat car. So the mirror actually sticks, stuck down below the hole in the mirror and they had to make sure <clears throat> that it would clear the railroad ties on its way out to California. Here's the mirror ready to go on the railroad. Railroad car. Now those that sign on the side, 200 inch telescope disc, uh, that is more than just advertising. Uh, that is actually uh, steel armor to keep people from shooting at the mirror as the mirror goes across the country. <clears throat> so here's the mirror arriving in uh, Pasadena, California. There it sits in Pasadena, ready to be unloaded. Here they are unloading it. Now, I, I'm not sure that I would be standing where that gentleman is standing underneath the mirror. Here it arrives at the optical shop at Caltech. And here's the crew at uh, Caltech optical shop, ready to work on the mirror. Now, meanwhile, we had work to do at Palomar Mountain. Now they actually investigated other sites for the observatory. I know two sites that were at least looked at were Table Mountain, which was north of uh, Mount Wilson and Vulcan Mountain, which is in San Diego County, southeast of Palomar Observatory. And they used this telescope to point at Polaris and look at the quality of the sky that they were getting. So here's the site on Palomar Mountain. Now, uh, it has to be explained, George Ellery Hale, he had, he dreamed of putting an observatory on Palomar Mountain from the beginning. They, they went through the motions of investigating other sites, but Hale really wanted to be on Palomar Mountain. Now, at the time, Palomar Mountain was one of the darkest places in the United States. San Diego, 40 miles to the southwest was tiny. Escondido, the nearest large town to, Mount, uh, to Palomar Mountain, was even tinier. Southwestern Riverside County was almost uninhabited. 
And there were large areas of Riverside County that didn't even have electricity. So there were no lights. Uh, things aren't quite as good today. But at the time they put the observatory there, they selected the site. Uh, it was a very dark site. So here they're starting to work on the site. By now it's the middle of the depression. And you can see a, a CCC camp down there at the bottom where they kept the workers to work on the site. One of the first things they built was the power plant. At the time, Palomar Mountain was not on the power grid. They had to generate their own power. <clears throat> Here's one of the giant generators that they used to create power. Now, getting up to the mountain could be problematic. Uh, the roads were not so good. Uh, here we're uh, digging a, uh, a car out of the uh, out of the mud. Uh, I'm not sure what happened here, but the roads were treacherous. Here they're drilling holes for the uh, uh, supports for the dome. This is the foundation of the telescope. They built the foundation first, and then they built the dome around the foundation. The, this foundation is anchored in the bedrock of the mountain, uh, 22 feet below the uh, surface of the mountain. And this is what supports the telescope. So here we're starting to build the dome. Now that foundation for the telescope is already inside the structure. Here we're polishing the rails. The dome has a, uh, a rotating, <clears throat> the top of the dome rotates. And it rotates on rails and rota rotates on wheels that look like railroad car wheels and on a track that looks like a railroad track. And here they are finally polishing the track so that the dome rotates very smoothly. A little more progress on the dome. Oh, the dome was built by Consolidated Steel Corporation of Los Angeles. Consolidated Steel still exists. Uh, they have a different name now, and I think they were located in Irwindale. Here's a gentleman working at the top of the dome. At the same time, they are building the dome for the 48-inch Schmidt camera and we will be talking about the Schmidt camera later on. Actually, I think the dome on the left, I think that's for the 18 inch Schmidt. And we will be talking more about that a little bit later. So here we are approaching completion of the dome, but we still don't have a telescope. There's the power plant on the right. So the steel part of the telescope, the structure of the telescope itself was built by Westinghouse at their plant in South Philadelphia. Now it happened that Westinghouse's plant in South Philadelphia was located immediately next to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And Westinghouse built turbines and machinery for Navy ships. So they had the ability to work on very large steel structures. Now, as of today, the Westinghouse plant in South Philadelphia no longer exists. So here they are working on, the, this is the, uh, the ring that surrounds the, uh, the mirror in the telescope. Here they are working on the uh, <clears throat> yoke mounting for the telescope. There's the giant horseshoe that is at the north end. This is the prime focus cage. In 1937, they had a dedication ceremony for the structure of the telescope. So there on the right, uh, there's a platform. There's a gentleman probably giving a speech. And you can see that plexiglass model of the telescope. Eh, let's see. Maybe you can see my cursor. There's the plexiglass model of the telescope. That's the same plexiglass model, to my knowledge, 
<clears throat> that was on the cover of the Sky magazine several slides ago. Now in this crowd, Albert Einstein is sitting there looking at the model. There's Einstein, you can see him. <clears throat> now Einstein was there for the dedication of the structure of the telescope. Einstein never visited Palomar Observatory. He visited Mount Wilson, but he never visited Palomar. So here we're taking some of the parts out of the uh, shop at South Philadelphia. <clears throat> they loaded the parts, the steel parts of the telescope onto a ship and they sent the parts by ship through the Panama Canal to the port of San Diego. And then they trucked the pieces of the telescope piece by piece up South Grade Road. Here we're bringing the parts of the telescope into the observatory dome. <clears throat> and now we're starting to put it together. Now, of interest in this picture, uh, you can see the south, the pier for the south end of the telescope, that uh, big hook is just above the uh, <clears throat> pier for the south end. And that uh, ball-shaped thing down at the bottom, that is the south bearing of the telescope. And that, when they put it together, that will fit inside that cup that you see. Uh, let's see if we can, there's that cup. And this thing down here at the bottom, I hope you can see the cursor. This thing will be on the structure of the telescope and it will fit in this cup. And there are pads in there with uh, that pump oil into the bearing of the telescope. So the telescope floats on oil. <clears throat> so here's more construction. Those of you who have visited the dome of the 200 inch Hale telescope probably know that there are two areas of the floor with panels that can actually be lifted out. And when they built the telescope, they lifted the pieces of the te telescope through those holes in the floor. So here they're lifting part of the horseshoe uh, north bearing of the telescope through the hole in the floor. Here they're pouring, uh, actually pouring concrete into the uh, horseshoe, uh, which well helps to stabilize it. So here we are uh, nearly done with the structure of the telescope. But we need a mirror. Meanwhile, back in Caltech, they are working on the mirror. So they started grinding and polishing the mirror. Here they're uh, grinding the mirror. Here it looks like they've uh, polished a lot of it. But the work was interrupted by World War II. So the mirror sat in a corner of the shop while Caltech was working on other projects related to the war. Finally, in December 1945, they resumed work on the mirror. And in October 1947, Marcus Brown, the lead optician, signed his name to the mirror, certifying that in his opinion, it was finished. So here we are taking the mirror to the observatory. This is in... Uh, uh, November, it was a two-day trip, November 18th and 19th, 1947. Here they are passing through Southern Orange County along Highway 101. Uh, those of you who have lived in Southern California for a while know that Southern Orange County doesn't look like this anymore. This is probably uh, around the Mission Viejo area. So the mirror, it took two days. It spent the night in Escondido. Those of you who uh, know the city of Escondido may know where the old Palomar Hospital is on Valley Parkway in Escondido. Well, Valley Parkway used to be called Ohio Street 
and the mirror was parked there right in front of the site of the hospital overnight. Now they had, uh, had a weather forecast by a crack meteorologist at Caltech for uh, uh, good weather, but uh, it rained. So here we're uh, bringing the mirror up South Grade Road. The gentleman standing on the box, now the box contains the mirror, of course. The gentleman standing on the box is relaying instructions from the driver at the front to the drivers on the two tractors at the rear. Here we're about to bring the mirror into the dome. So here it is in the dome. On the, on the bottom floor, uh, when we do the tours, this is where we start the tours. And uh, hopefully someday in the near future, we will be able to resume tours and you will be able to stand exactly <clears throat> where this mirror was sitting. Now they put an aluminum coating on the mirror. That is the reflective coating. And they build a special tank for putting on the aluminum coating in a vacuum. Now, the process for doing this was invented at Palomar Observatory. Most large reflecting mirrors before then used a coating of silver, but silver tends to tarnish and aluminum uh, lasts much longer. So they put the aluminum coating on the mirror. Here, well, here they're doing some uh, uh, final work on the, uh, on the surface of the mirror. In 1948, they had a dedication ceremony for the uh, telescope. And they dedicated the telescope in the name of George Ellery Hale. Now at this time, the telescope, the mirror itself was not quite in condition for research yet. That round tank at the upper right of the picture, that's where they illuminize the mirror. And they use it to this day that is the tank that they use for illuminizing the mirror. So here's the bust of George Elliott Hale that sits in the foyer at the observatory. Now they started testing the telescope on the night sky and they discovered that the mirror still needed a bit more work. So here somebody is using optical rouge a very fine quantity of optical rouge to uh, try to bring out down some high spots on the surface of the mirror. Now, here's a picture of Edwin Hubble sitting at the prime focus of the telescope. This telescope is so big that it was expected that the observer, the guy taking the pictures, would actually sit in the top of the telescope and guide the telescope while I was taking pictures. Hubble thought they were building the, this telescope for him. He wanted to continue the work that he had been doing at Mount Wilson. And, but it, uh, somebody had to give Hubble the sad news that uh, no, he would probably not be using the telescope. This is what we consider to be the first light picture of the telescope. Now they had taken some, some test images beforehand, but Edwin Hubble took this picture, <clears throat> this called Hubble's Variable Nebula. It's in the winter sky in the constellation of Monoceros. And uh, the uh, careful eye, when you look at this picture, you can see that there's probably a little more work to be done on the mirror. But we consider this to be the first light photograph. We started observations in 1949, November 13th, 1949. And this shows the log book of, of the observations. And you can see on this page that there are some mirror tests. And then finally on uh, November 13th, <clears throat> Milton Humason takes some of the first pictures. And then uh, a couple of days later, Walter Botta and then uh, Rudolf Minkowski are taking pictures with telescope. So we began science programs at the ob observatory. 
We use it an average of 300 nights a year. This is a modern picture of the telescope. Uh, let's see, I took this one in 2017. Now we have other telescopes on the mountain. <clears throat> yeah, first telescope that was put on the mountain was actually put into operation in 1936. It is a Schmidt camera. Now a Schmidt camera uses a big mirror in the back, but it has a very thin lens at the front of the telescope, which uh, make some optical corrections in the telescope. <clears throat> and it enables us to take very wide field pictures with the telescope. You cannot look through this telescope. Now in this picture, Fritz Zwicky is looking through a guide scope. He's not looking through the main telescope. He's looking through the guide telescope so he can make sure that the telescope is following the stars correctly. But the picture that the telescope that the 18 inch Schmidt is taking is there's a piece of glass, a glass plate deep inside the telescope. So you cannot look through this telescope, even if you wanted to. You can only guide it through the guiding eyepiece. Uh, Fritz Zwicky was a famous early user of the telescope. And Fritz Zwicky used this telescope to search for supernovae. And uh, Fritz Zwicky and Walter Bada coined the term supernova. Before the 1930s, any star that blew up that was deemed to be new was called just called a nova. There was no distinction between a nova and a supernova. Here is the 18 inch Schmidt camera today. It's sitting in the visitor center. If there's anybody uh, listening to this talk in the visitor center, this telescope is sitting right behind you. Now, based upon the test, that telescope was so successful that they quickly made plans to build a much bigger one. So they built a 48 inch Schmidt camera. And this telescope is still very much in operation. In this publicity photograph, you can see Edwin Hubble at, sitting at the, standing at the guiding eyepiece of the 48 inch Schmidt camera. This camera has been in operation since 1948, it went into operation before the uh, 200 inch Hale telescope. This Schmidt camera was used to complete two surveys of the Northern sky. And the, the pictures, the pictures for those surveys are, uh, they were on 14 inch square glass plates and they take, in, uh, they take in a huge area of the sky. The 200 inch Hale telescope at its widest takes in a picture about the size of the full moon. Well, they, did, they knew that they wanted to study galaxies but they weren't even sure of what galaxies they wanted to study. So they built this wide angle telescope to take wide angle pictures of the sky. This telescope is currently <clears throat> part of a project called the Zwicky Transient Facility. And the telescope is now called the Samuel Ocean Telescope. And they use this telescope to uh, uh, photograph the entire sky, night sky on very sensitive digital plates. And then they send the pictures to the uh, <clears throat> supercomputing center at UCSD to look for anything that has moved or blown up. They find thousands of things every night. The most interesting objects are selected for study with other telescopes, like this one, the 60 inch telescope. This was built in 1970. And at that time, the 200 inch Hale telescope was still very much the largest telescope in the world. <clears throat> and, but they knew that not every project required a 200 inch telescope. So they built the 60 inch telescope to take some of the observing load off of the 200 inch Hale telescope. 
These days, this telescope is often used for follow-up observations of things that have been discovered with the uh, 48-inch Schmidt camera. George Ellery Hill had a motto, make no small plans, dream no small dreams. And Palomar Observatory is the uh, result of his dreams. And I want to thank everybody for watching and listening to this. And I think we're probably going to open up for questions. Steve. Curtis, thank you very much for this. It's a, it's a great story. And well, and you tell it very well. Um, and with that, let me ask everybody, you can, you can turn on your microphones and I'll open the floor for questions. Please, please, anybody step in, step in with questions. Does anyone remember the date when they first, when they transitioned from photographic plates to CCD imaging? Uh, well, if I can step in here, Steve probably has a uh, more thorough answer. I, I think it was gradual. Uh, I think they started taking CCD images about 1978, but the very last photographic images, I think were taken in 1989. So, so it was kind of gradual. Uh, the uh, changeover. Steve, do you have any more information about that? No, I don't. Um, I think I think they began. Um, di digital digital imaging, um, mid seventies seventy nine, uh, but I've also. Also remember the date Ken just came up with uh, the last last photographic plate was used on this telescope in 1989. Last plate. It would be interesting to see that plate, see what they imaged. It would be interesting to see. Actually, what would be interesting would be to see the first. CCD image, because uh, I am uh, highly confident that the CCD <coughs> uh, chips that were available in 1978 <coughs> were not nearly as good as what we have in our amateur telescopes today. Well, that's probably true, but if I could point out, um, the first, first commissioned CCD camera was a thing called four shooter. Uh, four shooter is now in the Smithsonian Museum, and it was a it was an astronomical camera, but it was also a prototype for the uh, wide field and planetary camera that first went up in the Hubble Telescope. So that's, that's the other part of what we do here. We do research, but we also do engineering and prototyping. Um, and yes, that's, that's what I know about the history of the CCDs uh, at the observatory. Uh, for, for those of you who are uh, new to astronomy, there may be a few here. Uh, in the old days, they took pictures with a telescope on glass, photographic plates, five by seven inch glass photographic plates. Uh, these days we use digital cameras and the, the, uh, in the center of the camera, there's a uh, light sensitive chip somewhat similar to the uh, uh, light sensitive chip that's in your uh, digital camera, or your cell phone right now. Now, uh, I see a question in chat. Somebody asked about the scientific discoveries and that's a really excellent question. Uh, when this telescope was built, uh, one of the hanging questions was the size of the universe. 
And when uh, Edwin Hubble was using the 100 inch Hale telescope, he was able to uh, uh, find what are called Cepheid variable stars in some of the other nearby galaxies. Well, for one thing, he was able to prove that they were galaxies outside our own. But uh, he, he made an estimate of the distance of those galaxies that seemed to be problematic. It wasn't quite what was expected based upon the stars that he was looking at. So one of the motivations for building this telescope was to figure out how big the universe is. So among the very first projects on this telescope, Walter Bottom, I, I try to use the ger German pronunciation of his name, not Walter, Walter. Uh, Walter Bada used the telescope to look at stars in the nearby galaxies. He was looking at variable stars. He was looking at a class of stars that are a, a bit different than the Cepheid variables that Hubble had found. And interestingly enough, the stars that he was looking for even the mighty 200 inch Hale telescope could not resolve those stars. This brand new telescope that had been built for this project could not resolve those stars. And that implied that even the estimates that they had come up with for the distance of those galaxies up to that time, had to, the estimates had to be increased because these stars were beyond the capabilities of this telescope. This telescope in uh, 1963, was used to discover quasars, the optical part of quasars. Astronomers knew that there was something out there that was very bright, but they didn't know what they were. And so uh, uh, Martin Schmidt, using the 200-inch uh, Hale telescope, was able to discover <clears throat> the optical part of quasars. They were already known from radio telescopes, or things called radio telescopes. And so quasars were discovered with the uh, 200 inch Hale telescope. <clears throat> In recent years, uh, we still do some uh, edge of the universe type work, but a lot of the work with the telescope has been on uh, exoplanets, planets. You know, one of the problems with um, some of the estimates Edwin Hubble came up with for the uh, what we now call the Hubble constant, um, he came up with one estimate that um, made that calculated a universe that was younger than the objects in it, and. Uh, particularly a set of geologists questioned him on this. And, and, and it was clear Edwin Hubble had a problem. Um, and it took, it took a lot more time than it took the Hale telescope uh, and, and the work of Sandage to, uh, to come to an estimate that was, um, that was in time was generally accepted and not too far off from the estimates that we use now. I hope everybody can unmute themselves, mute themselves, and uh, let me let me ask if there are other questions. Please, please, people, jump in. This I have is a question about the forty-eight inch. I have a fourteen by fourteen inch glass plate here that's pretty thin. Were these the plates that were mechanically bent when they were installed in the in the yeah. in the telescope before exposure? Yes. Because when I try bending mine, it breaks. Uh, well, they broke a few. <laughs> Must have but, been done pretty, pretty carefully. The, the people up here who were using the 48 Schmidt camera became very skilled at bending those plates. They had a special press that put them into the plate holder and it bent the plates slightly. But yes, yes, they broke a few. <laughs> but, well, what, in, <clears throat> what amazes me is the plates that they used for the 18 inch Schmidt were much smaller. I think they're about six inches in diameter. They were round. 
and you can see them in the visitor center there. And they bent those. And how they bent those without breaking them, well, I assume they broke a few, but it, it, it's amazing that they, they were able to do that. <clears throat> this was a, uh, an exposure of Polaris taken on in June of 96, according to the, well, the, the uh, envelope it came in. Does it say who took the picture? <clears throat> no, plate number TF06868, and no person. Because nope. uh, 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 Gene Mueller, who is now retired, took many of those plates for the second Palomar survey in the uh, early 1990s. <clears throat> You know, I've always wondered. I cut. I I'm pretty sure they were digit. They're they're digitized and they're widely available. But I know that they were digitized on the a scanner at Flagstaff, the Naval Observatory in Flagstaff, and I also believe they were scanned at MIT. And I've always wondered. You know, given the fragility of those fourteen by fourteen plates packing them up and sending the flag staff and maybe on to MIT. I don't know if they were done in sequence, you know, on the, kind of the same trip or not. But, you know, it's it's kind of amazing that they managed to make it without breaking any. But we had that same challenge. I believe that they were stored on campus and Jane packed them up and moved them to the observatory. That's where they are now, aren't they? Yes, right. they're at the observatory. Uh, you're right. You're right. They had to be packed up for that. They were in the, one of the basements of the Robinson building on campus. Wow. Well, now, at least last time I saw them, we're talking uh, December 2008, they were in the uh, bottom floor of the 60-inch uh, telescope. Yeah, that's when I last saw them, too. And see. also, there were plates. There were uh, Down there in the basement of the 60-inch uh, telescope, there were also plates from the 18-inch Schmidt. There were plates with the uh, uh, the envelope as the personal signature of Fritz Zwicky. There were also uh, some pictures from uh, uh, Griffith Observatory, and I don't know what those are doing there. Are there other questions on um, Palomar Palomar Mountain? Uh, is there anything you can say about other research that was done on the mountain, like radio astronomy and magnetic measurements? There is no radio telescope on the mountain. To my knowledge, there has never been a radio telescope on the mountain. Uh, we we did have another. Well, OK, I, I, I'm yeah. hearing a, a hesitation there. Uh, you can chime in with your uh, updated information. Uh, we did have an interesting project the uh, uh, for a few years called the uh, uh, the test bed interferometer, the Palomar test bed interferometer, and that uh, sat on the ground north, north of the uh, big dome, and they had uh, there was a central building, and there were three small buildings with uh, small telescopes in them, and there were tubes that connected everything to the central building. Uh, that project was shut down, I think, about uh, 2010, and and the entire thing was dismantled. Okay, what do we have about radio telescopes? Steve will know this, but wasn't there an original radio telescope installation of some kind uh, somewhere between the 200-inch dome and and the uh, uh, the Schmidt telescope? Uh, was somewhere off that road? I, I don't know anything about it, but I remember people talking about it. Yeah, they did. They did an installation of a device. Uh, this was in the 50s. Um, and even by then, even by the 50s, this was this location was not sufficiently radio shielded <laughs> to support the work of a radio telescope. And it was at that point they were looking around and found Owens Valley. And well, Owens Valley is between two mountain ranges. And it's, uh, 
it's really quite well shielded, uh, at least relatively, against radio interference. Um, and with that, they dismantled the telescope, the radio telescope that was put up here. You want me to take your book? Yeah. Other things. Do you have any pictures of that original radio telescope? I have seen pictures of it. Um, I will. I will look and see what. See if I can. See if I can locate it again. Yeah. How big? How big was it? Compared compared to what they've got at Owens Valley now, it was pretty small. It was. You know, we're talking six, eight meters, something like that. Uh, it was really, a, it, it was a test. It was, it was a test instrument. They wanted to see what kind of, uh, of radio quality they could get. It wasn't, it wasn't meant for a, a big, big installation. Well, I, uh, a point I, about about the uh, science uh, discoveries of the telescope, um, I, I think from a perspective of the outreach and getting uh, the younger generation involved with astronomy and the telescope and what's going on here, um, a different narrative might be more engaging to the younger kids. Uh, exoplanets, black holes, uh, quasars, uh, and starting the narrative with the discoveries and how this has grown our knowledge of the universe, I think is a very uh, important and, and gripping story that the younger generation would hear. Uh, and, and then working back to the mechanics of the telescope and the history. Um, and I, I know that the it's, it's an incredible story talking about how the telescope got here, the perfect machine and everything, that's, that's very engaging, but it's still kind of a, a level of nostalgia that I don't think the the younger generation has a lot of patience for. Uh, they they want to get to uh, the, the more engaging uh, stuff. So I, I guess if, if when I when I guess I'm asking for more of the science narrative coming through, particularly to the outreach and to the young kids that see this amazing machine and and stuff. But what has it done for us? How has it explained the cosmos? What are the terms we use today about the universe and cosmos and everything that that actually came out of this machine's usage? So that's that's just a uh, perspective I'm uh, uh, trying to advocate and like to see happen more about it. So, well, Ken, if well, I'm not mistaken, don't you have a, a follow-up spiel to this on dealing just with the science? Say again. Doesn't Ken have a, a follow-up spiel on on? on this talk just dealing with with specifically with the science yeah yeah i do uh and it's actually a pretty good one it, it, the predecessor of what curtis just presented came from scott cardell uh yeah. the predecessor of my talk came from andy bowden you know he did the first too many words if you know andy too many words. but uh but yeah and that's pretty effective but the idea uh on the tour for example we tend to do science at the end of the tour when you're up at the south end, uh, up on the up on the catwalk, looking at the scope. I think it we might think about some teasers at the very beginning, rather than going into the George Hale and the history and so forth, and the the magnificence of the building. Yeah, I think that's a real good idea. Thank you. Okay. Maybe. Uh... Ken will honor us with his uh, science talk in some uh, in the near future. Yeah, I, I keep upgrading it all the time because, you know, about every three months, just, you know. Well, the technology keeps changing, too, because they're bringing in new cameras, more sensitive, and uh, uh, the story is changing. Well, you know, I think it was just brilliant for the... Uh, uh, to use the um, uh, the one meter plane wave, you know, I know it's very expensive, 
but telescopes tend to be more like prototype telescopes. And here's a here's a production unit that you can get assembled and delivered and installed by pros. And it must have saved them a tremendous amount of time to do it that way. Well, Tom, um, thank thank you for that suggestion, and it it is really really something we need to consider and think about. Uh, Tom T in the chat had a question about uh, the predecessor telescopes. Uh, mm. I guess Curtis, would you like to pick up on that one? Uh, let's see, where is it? Where is it? Uh, Okay, well, what is the question? Prior to the 200 inch telescope, what had been the largest telescope? How big was it and where was it located? Okay. That's the question. Uh, prior to the 200 inch, the biggest telescope was the 100 inch telescope on Mount Wilson. And uh, uh, that was in one of our earlier slides. And that telescope still exists. And uh, its companion, the 60 inch, which was in its time, the largest telescope in the world still exists. They're both on Mount Wilson. And I urge anybody here uh, who's interested in astronomy to go up to Mount Wilson to visit those uh, historic telescopes because you, you can see the chair that Hubble sat in while he was operating the telescope. You can see the controls that he used. Uh, it, it's just fascinating. You can see the uh, uh, inter the uh, gadget called an interferometer that uh, uh, Michelson used to measure the size of uh, Betelgeuse. Uh, there's a lot of historic stuff there at Mount Wilson. Now, after the 200 inch was built, there was a leftover uh, 120 inch blank, a test blank, that had been made by Corning when they were working on the 200 inch. There was a 120 inch blank that was sitting around the shops at Corning and University of California used that to build a 120 inch telescope, which is on uh, at Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton near San Jose right now. H have I answered the question uh, adequately? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, there were a couple of other big telescopes that fit into this. Uh, uh, between the construction of the uh, 60 inch and the 100 inch, for a brief period of time, there was a 72 inch telescope in Canada that was actually the largest telescope in the world for a brief period of time. And uh, after the 200 inch was built, the uh, uh, 82 inch at M McDonald Observatory in uh, Texas was uh, the second largest telescope in the world. So there, there's been a lot of contention for largest telescope. Can I just add something to this? This is Please, Jay. Jay. So after they built Palomar, the Russians tried building the BTA-6, as you know, which was uh, uh, much bigger about nine, almost 20 feet in diameter, but it was built in a terrible place in the Caucasus Mountains, near where Russia had the Sochi Olympics. And the terrible weather and the <laughs> bad construction of the mirror and telescope, uh, you had mentioned about an hour ago that it was made, but it hardly had any good, uh, useful, great pictures. Is that correct? As far as I know, that is correct. Uh, actually, that telescope, uh, yes, they, they even had to replace the mirror at least once on it. Uh, it was uh, the mirror on that, the six meter mirror was a giant version of the mirror that we have in the uh, uh, 200 inch. However, it, it has been easy to uh, dump on that telescope as being in a terrible location and uh, having technical problems. But in one respect, that telescope pointed toward the future in that it does not have an equatorial mounting. It is not, does not have a mounting that points up to Polaris so you can follow the stars with one motion. 
It has a, an altazimuth mounting, which makes mounting the telescope much easier. It makes tracking the stars somewhat more difficult because it requires computers. But that altazimuth mounting, which simply goes right, left, and up and down rather than uh, following the axis of the Earth, really pointed the way to the future. And all of the giant telescopes that are being built now, the, the Keck telescopes, the telescopes that are being built in Chile, those are all use uh, uh, altazimuth mounts. So the uh, uh, great altazimuth reflector in the Caucasus Mountains, although it was not a, uh, although I'm not aware of any serious discoveries that have come out of it, in some ways, it technically it pointed the way to the future. I believe they installed the third mirror on that telescope a few years ago, within three or four years. Uh, uh, several years ago, by the way, just, just as a, a side story, I gave a, a private tour to some astronomy students from Russia. Ooh. They lived in a city called uh, uh, Kroznoyarsk in Siberia. and. Uh, uh, what was well? One thing that was interesting was they uh, they had a translator with them who was translating from uh, English into Russian because I don't speak Russian, but it turned out that apparently most of them spoke some English anyway. But uh, uh, during my presentation about the 200-inch Hale telescope, I never said anything derogatory about their telescope, and I never said anything about how the uh, L telescope was the biggest effective telescope for 45 years. I never mentioned that. I, I didn't want to cause an international incident. <laughs> well, if you want to know another odd little bit of telescope trivia, the last major telescope that used a speculum metal mirror, because remember, they learned a silver uh, uh, mirror sometime about the 1850s, 1860s, thereabouts. The last one was the Great Melbourne Reflector that was, I believe it's a 40-inch telescope, and that was uh, that was put up in 1850. So if you can imagine how much progress we've made with silvered mirrors that are so much more reflective than speculum metal, you know, just polished metal of brass and tin to, to where we are today. Well, in fact, Ken, you brought up a... a, a... Interesting, interesting point. Uh, during the tours, when I talk, give the tours, I talk about the 40-inch refractor at Yerkes Observatory from 1897. Mm -hmm. And I have had a couple of people point up, uh, talk about, well, what about Lord Ross's 72-inch speculum metal reflector in Ireland? Well, it is my understanding that by the time the Yerkes refractor was built, that telescope had been uh, dismantled and was no longer operational. Uh, so, so that's my answer to that question when people ask about it. Well, Curtis, thank you very much. I had a great presentation. Greatly appreciate the time you took on it. And this meeting is now extending, um, but we're almost an hour and a half into it. Which is are we in, are we in overtime? <laughs> we will be soon, but I think we I think we need to wind the uh, wind the meeting down. And if there are no further questions, last call Thank for you. questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Thank you, Thanks. Curtis. Thanks, Curtis. And you will notice, you will notice the tremendous crowd we had here in <laughs> the museum today. <laughs> yes, my, my refractors and reflectors discussion was uh, not well <laughs> taken. <laughs> Well, anyway. What can you do? What can you do? There just aren't many people up here on the mountain today. So.
Let me conclude with a note about our next meeting. The next Greenway meeting take place on Saturday, December 17th. Dr. Joss Bland Hawthorne <clears throat> is ARC Laureate Professor of Physics in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. And he's also director of the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. At our next meeting, he will discuss our galaxy's formation and the new methods and techniques that are enabling us to chart its evolution. Why does the sun owe its existence to a collision between the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy and the Milky Way that occurred 15 billion, year, excuse me, five billion years ago? Professor Bland Haw, Haw, Hawthorne, excuse me, will answer this and many other questions in a presentation titled Galactic Seismology, Giant Waves Crossing the Milky Way. And let me also note that the meeting on the 17th will begin at two o'clock Pacific Standard Time in order to accommodate Professor Bland Thornton's schedule in Sydney. So with that, again, thank you, Curtis. Thanks as well to all of you for attending. Everybody. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Thank Love you for the pictures. <laughs> thank you very much. And we'll see you next time.